I've never given a talk behind bulletproof glass. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. Um, I was thinking, looking at this exhibit, that, you know, there are a number of things behind a building. Um, and in the case of these buildings, it's ego and money and social change. And so that's sort of the framework of what I wanted to do for you this evening, is tell you, in a sense, how this building we're admiring really had its roots on the other side of the Mississippi River in St. Louis. Um, now I'm going to see if my clicker will work and we'll be on our way. Yeah. Um, so just very briefly, to give you a sense, Pulitzer, like many of the uh, changers in the 19th century, is an immigrant. He comes from a small town in southern Hungary called Mako. And the reason I love this picture, which was taken about the time he was being raised, um, there are a number of Jewish businesses, and one of them who you can't read because the slide's a little fuzzy, uh, using, as we call it, my family, uh, the Google, I discovered is a confectionery still in business in Brooklyn who migrated to the United States. So it isn't just newspapers. Um, our taste in sweets came from this little town. Um, Pulitzer came to the United States by unusual circumstances. We had a civil war that didn't seem to end. And, you know, if you remember your American history, we thought it would be over in a year. After a number of years, young men seemed un uh, convinced that it was a good idea to go get themselves killed, so we instituted a draft. But the draft had this little uh, loophole you could get out if you wrote a check for $300. The community, nonetheless, had to find the soldiers to send off to war. So Boston had the clever idea of sending a recruiter to Europe. He advertised widely in Europe, and the circumstances in Pulitzer's life was that all of his brothers, except for one, had died. His father had died, his mother had remarried a man, so he didn't like the stepfather. I mean, all these kinds of conditions that were ripe for departure, and he answered the ad and ended up coming to the United States on a ship of nothing but men ready to serve in the Civil War. And what's fun is he actually signed up for the Civil War in Park Row, at, in, the, in the, the City Hall Park, right across the street from the building that, or the place he would later inhabit. So he goes off to the Civil War, and um, I wish I could tell you he was a great hero. He basically played chess in uh, Virginia, didn't fire on anyone. But he did participate in the Grand Review, which is really a, a spectacular moment in American history when all the troops marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. And I'm not suggesting he did this, but in a literary sense, I thought it was interesting the troops gathered by the Capitol, which had just had its dome put on it. And here is a man who's left Hungary, and all of the architecture in his town is imperial architecture, stressing power coming down from the top. The capital, we forget, is really an example of democratic architecture intended to celebrate the house of the people and the Senate. And so I love the fact that Pulitzer's beginning his new life in America as a civilian. For the first few minutes, he's standing by this building. So I think there's a lot about architecture that, that interacts with Pulitzer. These are two shots of St. Louis. Um, There we go. Um, and he ends up going to St. Louis, and he never tells us why, but I think we can surmise it. He's an unemployed uh, Union soldier, comes to New York, and you know we have a very hard time after the war reintegrating soldiers into the economy. So he's a, he's a New York bum. He goes to French's hotel, he gets thrown out of the lobby, he spends the night on park benches, and he finds his way to St. Louis, and I would surmise the reason is pretty simple. Despite the fact St. Louis is Saint Louis, founded by French, it's a German city, and his language is German. After the failed Hungarian Revolution, everybody was raised teach, speaking German in Hungary. So here was a town where a young German-speaking person could get on the first rung of economic success. They had German papers published every day, German streets, German food, all kinds of things. So he ends up in St. Louis, and he falls under the orbit of Carl Schurz, who uh, you in New York know for his New York life, but at that point he was becoming a senator from Missouri, and he was also the co-publisher of the leading German paper in town, the Westlich Post. Um, and I'm really shortening the story because we're going to want to get to New York, but Pulitzer becomes a reporter for this paper. This is very significant. Um, oh, I love these. I, just to give you a taste of this, um, Kepler and some other cartoonists just loved Pulitzer. So before he's even famous, you can find him in, in cartoons off to the side. And I think this cartoon is Kepler's joke because at one point Pulitzer is a waiter in a St. Louis restaurant. He dumps a tray of food in the customer's lap and to give you a sense of Pulitzer's temper, he berates the customer for this accident. Um, I may be reading too much into this, but Kepler uh, loved cartooning Pulitzer. Anyway, this is a cartoon that begins to give you a lot of clues. 
The Westlick Post was a reformist newspaper, and today might sound oxymoronic, but was part of a group called Liberal Republicans. Um, and they were interested in old-fashioned good government issues, uh, expanding the franchise so more people could vote, getting rid of corruption. And so Pulitzer is a reporter for the paper, and on the night of December 4th, he's off uh, covering a Republican uh, meeting in a uh, neighborhood in which they're going to choose the candidate to stand for the state legislature. Basically, while he's out of the room, almost as a joke, they nominate him to be the state legislator. Now, the reason he wins is an interesting aspect of American politics. This is just after the Civil War. Only folks in, in, who could vote in Missouri were newly enfranchised African-American male voters and Republicans. Democrats certainly couldn't vote, and those who voted had to sign a loyalty oath. And the loyalty oath said something like, if your second cousin third, uh, three times removed had said something nice about the Confederacy, forget about voting. So being nominated was tantamount to being elected, and Pulitzer went off to Jefferson City. Now, we're 21st century people, and we, when we refer to government, we think of that place down the Amtrak ride from here down in Washington. You have to recast yourself into the 19th century. Washington was a swamp-infested place that no one went to, and they didn't make any real laws. I mean, sure, they went to war every once in a while, messed around with currency, but most of the lawmaking in the United States <coughs> took place in buildings just like this. Laws about murder, education, whatever. So imagine, Pulitzer hasn't been in the country five years. Now, he's a little dishonest about things. He lies about how long he's been here to become a citizen. He's already lied to join the military because he's too young. And now he swears on the oath to uphold the Missouri Constitution, and he's a year too young to be in the legislature. Just a minor detail. <laughs> but it is an empowering experience. These are farmers, these are lawyers, newspaper reporters, all these people coming together to make the laws of their land, Missouri. But Pulitzer adds an extra dimension to it. He doesn't give up his job as a reporter. So he now is the capital correspondent in Jefferson City, reporting in the third person on the wonderful work of this new young representative from St. Louis. <laughs> um, and one of the people who he really angers is this fellow named Augustine. Now, this is a period of immense corruption, and part of the reason I'm going on here is I want to set the stage for the reformist ideals he's going to bring to New York. In the sense, his political education takes place in Missouri. Augustine is a contractor in St. Louis County, doing really well. His wide girth is a reflection of his financial success. <laughs> he, um, he had the contract to build pretty much anything that the county government wanted to build, including its new insane asylum. And he signed a contract to dig a well in which he was going to be paid by the foot. Now, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. When I say that to an audience out there, everybody gets it right away. <laughs> You're not going to strike water. And sure enough, he went down and dug the second deepest well on the globe, the <laughs> deepest one being in Belgium at that time, and didn't strike water. Now, this is an interesting tale because Pulitzer is beginning to develop a sense of the power of language. And so he dubs that well the well of fools, fools being a euphemism for insane uh, people with mental difficulties at that time, which really angers Augustine. Now Pulitzer is a member of the state legislature, and he's pat trying to get laws that are going to eliminate this kind of corruption in St. Louis. Augustine is not happy. He comes to Jefferson City to lobby. At the Schmidt Hotel, these two men um, exchange words, and one of the words they use is pup, P-U-P. It's a word we could use today, but if I used it back then, one of you would be going to get your guns because it's an invitation to duel. Well, it just so happens legislators did pack heat. Pulitzer went back to his room, got his gun, came back to the Schmidt Hotel, and was ready to uh, end Augustine's life. Now, I know some of you may be veterans. I'm not casting any aspersions on military training. But this is a Civil War veteran who is unable to hit a man the side of a barn with two shots. <laughs> um, so Augustine does get grazed in the leg, rushes over, takes away the, um, the gun, actually hits Pulitzer with a... Um, uh, brass knuckle. Now, it's a great story, but I regularly get accused of making this up because you'll notice there's a similarity between Augustine and me in our looks, you know, <laughs> but it is an original Kepler drawing and it is a true story. Uh, again, the flavor of the times, Pulitzer's next position is, although he has a charge of potential murder hanging over his head, he becomes police commissioner in St. Louis. <laughs>
Um, but a movement of principled stand. You remember I was telling you that he's part of this group that wants to reform American politics, and one of the things he wants to do is give back the vote to Democrats and disenfranchised folks. And he stands for that, he does it, and of course the accomplishment of succeeding in doing that means that he's going to lose office, which is in fact what he does. And this cartoon represents the election in 1870, where he's toppled by the very voters whose votes he gave back to them. I tell you this because I want you to keep getting a sense of the idealism that's infecting this young man. The notion of being an immigrant coming to this land and suddenly making laws and doing all of these things is very infectious and it has a lot to do with the journalism that he's going to practice. And he continues in the liberal Republican movement. He goes off to Cincinnati with shirts. They make the mistake of nominating a newspaper publisher, Horace Greeley, who goes down to defeat in the presidential election. And we're now going to get to his newspapering and the beginning of getting this building here in New York. This is a cartoon in 1878. And it's uh, a drawing of Pulitzer on the steps of the St. Louis County Courthouse, which if you were to go there today is a plaque recognizing it for where the Dred Scott decision was. I think it needs a second plaque to tell you this is in a sense the birth of the American modern mass media. Because what's going on is there are three afternoon papers for, in, being published in St. Louis. None of them are doing very well, and one of them is bankrupt, and Pulitzer is using his last few dollars to buy the bankrupt pieces of his newspaper. He's taking an enormous chance. And you mentioned earlier the sense of genius. Pulitzer has a different kind of genius than some of the 19th century people. He's not going to invent anything. He's not going to say, we need a gadget by which we can call each other, or something to record people. He is much more, and this is a, a huge metaphoric leap, so follow me for a second. He's much more like a California surfer. If you've ever been to the coast of California and you look out there, you'll see these young men and women on boards just past the waves, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and then suddenly one of them out of the bunch will paddle madly, and the largest wave will emerge underneath them, and they'll ride on the shore. Pulitzer was seeing social and economic changes, waves of change coming, and he figured out how to ride them. And what were these waves? Well, there was the invention, gaslight, electric light, you could read at night. Farmers were leaving the farms and coming to the cities and becoming commuters. The women who had made economic decisions on the farms were now making different kinds of economic decisions, where to buy wheat, where to buy gingham. Um, there was the invention of the Victorian internet, the telegraph, bringing information from New York and Washington as fresh as that morning. New paper products have been developed using trees that had high tensile strength that could go through printing presses with extraordinary speed. The new printing presses were being invented. All of these things were coming together and Pulitzer recognized them. So he began publishing an afternoon newspaper with news that was as fresh as that morning, meaning the morning papers had yesterday's news. He was selling it to commuters anxious for something to read on the way home. For women who wanted the advertising, advertising, you know, isn't just persuading you to buy something, it's important economic information. And all of this was packaged in a storytelling formula not to be beat, exposing all kinds of corruption in St. Louis, representing the interests of the middle class. The paper became a champion of reform, a champion of the middle class. And it became so successful that soon he bought out the star, sold off its parts like a rag salesman, and Pulitzer all of a sudden burst on the scene in the United States as one of the major newspaper publishers. Unfortunately for Pulitzer, St. Louis is St. Louis. And as you know, the real action in this world takes place in New York City. And so he set his eyes on New York City. And despite any stories you ever heard about him accidentally buying the New York world, there was nothing accidental about it. He came to New York, negotiated with Gould to buy the bankrupt uh, morning world that Gould didn't want to own. He bought by accident as part of a larger asset sale. And he was going to duplicate the exact formula of St. Louis. The papers referred to it as Western-style journalism. Now, newspapers at that time were a very genteel business. There was the penny press, but they weren't the dominant papers of the town. And most of them looked like this gray lady, which is the world just before Pulitzer buys it. You know, no headlines of any size. You sometimes had to read the whole story to find out what happened. The typical letter from London would be something like, the fog has lifted, the queen has been seen about, and oh, by the way, the war is over. <laughs> Um, and so Pulitzer began introducing his Western-style journalism, breaking open the page with illustrations, large headlines, 
and all kinds of dynamic things. Introduced color presses, um, which made you know really exciting pages of all sorts. And all of a sudden, you had a dynamic newspaper that was an enormous success that no one could miss. And the greatest invention of the 19th century, the color Sunday comic. Um, and this, a lot of this rested on the, sh on the shoulders of these young boys, newsboys, sometimes called street Arabs, and other things. Because what we forget now, and we always think we have all the most modern news gathering stuff, it had it all in the 19th century. The morning papers were subscribed to, so you would find the world at your door. But starting at 9 o'clock in the morning, the evening papers began publishing. And they would often publish every hour, depending on the news. And so they had to write headlines that these uneducated children could read, because yelling out the headlines were important. Died is a great short word. That's the kind of thing. And you still see it today. Go and buy the Daily News and the New York Post. You'll see that same style of headline writing. Um, so it got to be terrible. These, these kids were a terribly important cog in this news distribution because, for instance, when Harry K. Thaw, it was a great storytelling in this building, um, you know, Harry K. Thaw had committed, killed Stanford White in public in front of a lot of people. Kind of hard to get off that. And he used the first insane, asylum, insane insanity defense, which was then called the trial of the century before somebody in Los Angeles uh, was put on another trial at the end of our century. <laughs> This trial was so exciting for the city that Irvin Cobb sat in the courtroom, wrote out the stories longhand. It was handed to a young boy who went downstairs in the courtroom, picked up an open phone, dictated the story back to the world, and that hour's testimony would be out on the street. And for a penny, you could go out and buy it. So all the lawyers all around town would buy the paper every hour. So the news gathering enterprise becomes a very important part of culture in New York. It is um, this whole notion of news as a commodity that you buy is emerging from all of this process. And Bolzer becomes this immense success. This cartoon shows him taking all the want ads from Dana and Bennett and the other papers. And uh, we're going to get to another structure and tell one more tale before we get to our building. Now, you know, I told you about these street waves selling the paper. Pulitzer was establishing also a different relationship with a large group of New Yorkers who've been ignored. And these were the immigrants. Um, the folks were coming to New York, you know, by in waves beginning in the 1880s and 1890s in enormous quantities. The Lower East Side was the most densely populated spot in the world. And so Pulitzer was admonishing his reporters to write about these folks, write in short, understandable sentences about the things that mattered to them. So the folks on the upper reaches of Fifth Avenue would open up their world if they dared buy it, and it would say, Tiny Tot falls to its death in front of Mother. And one of them holding the teacup appropriately with the little finger up and say, Oh, this is a sensationalistic prattle! How dare they publish this stuff? And in fact, clubs and libraries began to ban the world because, you know, what an influence it could have on our children. Just like if you remember in the 1950s, we had congressional hearings on comic books. And then there was this vice president's wife, Tipper Gore, who was worried about lyrics. I mean, this goes on and on. You just, you know, nothing's not new. Anyway, the point is that they were missing the point in their criticism. Because if you went to the Lower East Side and went into the Black and Tans bars or into those dining rooms, this is what those folks were talking about. They weren't talking about who went to what party. They weren't talking about economic news from Europe. They were talking about the death of these children because it did happen. In the summertime, those tenements were so crowded that people would go to the top floor of the building in order to sleep because you couldn't breathe inside those dumbbell-shaped buildings. And kids would fall to their death. And Jacob Reese, the famous reporter, wrote a story called The Human Reign. And he said, every summer this begins. So when Pulitzer admonished his reporters to write about them, he was writing about them in a way that brought meaning to their lives. And I'll give you, this is just a, an analogy. Don't panic. I'm not going to ask you to do this. But if you were to invite me to your house tonight, <laughs> I am betting that on your refrigerator is a clipping of some sort. It could be about a wedding, an obituary, a children's sports achievement, academic achievement. Why do we keep those? The event occurred without it. It's because print brings, provides meaning to the event. We cherish it. That, in a nutshell, was what Pulitzer was doing for the largest disenfranchised group of people in New York. And in return, he was providing them with one heck of a package. You could buy the New York World on Sundays as thick as a telephone book, get the serialization of novels, help you learn English. Uh, you could get a dress pattern. 
You could get economic news, political news, all kinds of things. And you know, younger members of this audience probably download music. Well, they could too. Every week, the world printed the latest sheet music of the latest songs. You can go home and play it. That's what the world was giving them. So in 1885, when the French folks were giving us, and keep in mind, you remember, it's not the French government, the French people were giving us this minor statue, we were supposed to build a pedestal to erect it, and nothing was happening. So the New York World and the Pulitzer published a huge front page story about this in an editorial saying, bring in your money to the New York World offices, we'll count it, credit it, and have it used for this. Now this doesn't sound like a big deal, but you know, if Citicorp called you up tonight and said, send me a dollar for some cause, you might have a th thought. The reason this is so significant is it shows this immense trust that the lowest members of New York society had in Pulitzer to come in with their pennies and dimes, turn it over to him for this. And in return, what did he do? He printed their names in the paper. So the next day, you would see your name in the same paper that had the Astors and the Vanderbilts and all the glorious members of that 400 group in that paper, there would be your name. Of course, you might also buy the paper to keep that, so it worked all kinds of ways, and of course the sculpture went up. So Pulitzer now is this immensely powerful man, publishing a newspaper that has succeeded beyond all dreams. The man who makes the printing presses cannot create new presses that are fast enough to meet the demand. Um, the, new, the New York City is being reshaped in every way, and now it's about to be reshaped physically by the world building, whose evidence you see all around you, and you'll hear about just about now. Park Row isn't just a place where newspapers work. It's a social happening. If you really want to score with your date, in the 1880s, you might say, let's go down to Park Row, because there is no CNN, there is no NPR. If you want to know what's happening, you've got to go down to Park Row, because on the second story of the buildings, they were putting up news. So if it was a presidential election, if you sat at home, you didn't know what was happening, you'd go down to Park Row. So there was, for instance, America's yacht. You remember that? Well, no, no planes or remote cameras. So they had somebody telegraphing the results, and they had two small yachts moving across the building, and you could see who was winning. There was a boxing match waged in one of the Caribbean islands, and the world hired two marionettes to reenact the blows as they were being telegraphed in. The crowd of 20,000 went nuts over this and demanded that they do it all over again. What I like about this is a century before ABC Wild World of Sports, the agony of defeat, you know, all that stuff, instant replay on Park Row. So this isn't just a simple block to build a building on. This is an, a social, economic, and the, and the media center of New York, and that's where Pulitzer is going to decide to put his building, and he's going to hire this guy named George B. Post. And I rarely do this, but um, I'm just going to read you a little tidbit about him um, from the book so you get a sense of what's going on. Pulitzer, at this point, has begun his demise. He's beginning to go blind. He suffers from detached retinas. There are a couple things to keep in mind. This is like Beethoven not being able to hear his own music. Pulitzer's going to cease to have the ability to read his own work. But there's also something else about blindness at this period. Blindness is, doesn't mean just alone you can't see. It also means you shouldn't be seen. Helen Keller had not been around yet. And so men who became blind became recluses. Add to this the powerful fact that Pulitzer's beset with every kind of, how should we put it, psychological issues that you could have combination is a toxin, and he becomes a, a recluse on the order of Howard Hughes. But before he completely becomes that way, he hires George Post uh, to do the building. So while he's in California, he, he's beginning to travel all the place, he's bought French's Hotel, and if you remembered earlier, I mentioned it. This is the hotel that banned him from the lobby, and this is great. I always love telling young people this because this is an example of revenge, the dish best served cold. Years later, he buys the hotel and tears it down. Um, and so uh, Pulitzer uh, uh, wants to build this hotel, so he bought, I mean, build this, so he has a, um, uh, he's going to have his own money. And he, the architect George Brown Post, who's then a student of Richard Morris Hunt, heard about Pulitzer's purchase of this land and wrote to a friend at the world, this is this inside business, asking to be recommended to his boss. Post had just completed a design for a new park row building for the New York Times. And he writes, 
It would be an interesting problem to construct two buildings inside of each other for rival papers to make the building as different as the politics of the paper. Pulitzer decides to hold a contest, and Post actually ends up winning. So in Paris, Pulitzer lays down his conditions. The building had to rise a full 14 stories, making it the tallest on the globe. The cost could not exceed $950,000, and had to be completed by October 1 of 1890. That's a year later. If he failed, Post would, oh sorry, if he succeeds, Post would receive a $50,000 commission and a $10,000 bonus. If he failed, he would pay $20,000 of the commission. Finally, all design elements had to be approved by Pulitzer, which is going to be a nightmare, before any contracts for the work are awarded, and added Pulitzer, the final building must, quote, be at least as good as the Times building, which is now in the process of construction. So Post goes to work on this design, and as the months pass, Pulitzer grows increasingly frustrated. Because you see, it had been his intention, Pulitzer's intention, to hire an architect the way you hire a portraitist for his artistry, his vision, his interpretation. And that's not what he's getting from Post. Post is so nervous, he's trying to figure out what the client wants rather than presenting him with his view. So the architect comes to Paris to go over the plans with Pulitzer. The meeting, shall we say, was not a great success. In confidence of the strictest nature, writes Pulitzer, I'm bound to say that I'm not encouraged to a greater faith in our architect by this visit, he writes to his business manager in New York. He may be a great architect in carrying out other people's ideas, but he certainly is not, in this case, carrying out many of his own. I thought you guys who know something about architecture would appreciate that comment. Money, of course, becomes a point of contesting, uh, a fight between the two. Post persuades him to spend another 60000 raising it to a million. And this goes on. And, uh, and later, when Pulitzer is fabulously successful and employs McKean, McKim White, I never get the order right, McKim means White, you know, the trio, <laughs> to build his mansion on 73rd Street. If you want really fun reading, and particularly if you've ever had a lowly job in a business and you've been chased around by the client, read what he does to these folks. And at this point, he's blind, and so he has to feel the model for his house. And so these poor guys are working Saturdays and Sunday nights because how do you get a model to Europe at that point? It's not by FedEx. You have to catch the ship before it leaves. So they, they have a clock in their office, and they've got three more hours, and they're madly painting and sticking glue on this thing and running it down New York to get it to them. So this is the kind of thing that Post faced in building this building. Pulitzer has the cornerstone laid, and you remember I mentioned that he was going blind and not to be seen, so he sends Joseph Jr. Uh, to lay the cornerstone. What I like about Joseph is he carries the name of the father, and Pulitzer, if you read the book, what you'll discover is one of the biggest creeps when it comes to family. He's just cruel and vicious to his children. He's also blind in another interesting way. He doesn't recognize, and granted he's too young, but this Joseph too young, this is the man who has inherited the journalistic genes not the other part of the family. Ralph and Herbert and others are perfectly fine people, but they don't understand journalism the way this guy is going to do. So I love the fact that he's sent to lay the cornerstone of this building. And being a media event, before we use the media, um, they wanted to do something to uh, signify the beginning construction of what was going to become the tallest building on the globe. So they put in a copper box in a cornerstone, and in it they put a number of items, photographs, copies of newspapers, these renderings, um, and even more exciting, a wax cylinder recording. In the 1870s, we began recording voices. That's only 10 years before this. Um, and it was a really cool gadget, just like several of you have iPhones and you just can't wait to play with them. Those folks couldn't wait to play with wax cylinder recordings. So what you're about to hear is an actual recording that was found in this box of voices from 1889. And I'm only going to play you a short excerpt, but I want you to keep in mind that these are newspaper men who are chatting, and you'll see they chat just like reporters do today. The part you don't hear about is they're like little kids. Have you ever handed a tape recorder to a child? They, the, even the most talkative child suddenly doesn't want to say anything. And if they do, they don't know what to say. Well, when they first start recording, the part you're not hearing, they don't know what to say, so they read the serial number off the machine. <laughs> so listen carefully. Um, here's, here's what they have to say. The New York Baseball Club has just won the league championship. Hold on for the New York Baseball Club. 
This year, 1889 has been a wonderful year for disaster. The first of the year, the Brooklyn Southwest blew up. And the great size only had blew down the bridge. The suspected bridge is now as we fall. Later in the summer, we had a great flood that gallop down, and the whole city was swept away. And also in China and Japan, they've had great floods, and a great landslide in Quebec, Ontario. No, not Ontario, it was in the city of Quebec, in Canada. Chicago wants to get the World's Fair in 1892. But we won't get it because New York is going to get there just the same. <laughs> the classic landing steam ships the city of New York is the fastest boat now on record. He makes the draw of the first in less than six days. Edison has just won his last suit from the big bike uh, or rather from the Westinghouse Company. Yours truly, A.W. Rose. Now, aren't those typical reporters? The first thing that animates them is disasters. <laughs> then, aren't they typical reporters? How good is their prediction about the future? <laughs> so, if you're worried about the election, no matter which side you are, don't believe anything you read when they say, oh, for sure, this guy's going to win. <laughs> um, so, I, it just, it's a, I love, the favorite use I've had of this recording is playing it for young high school people, because it's a one-way telephone call with the past. I mean, it is time travel, and it's really mesmerizing. But this is the sense of how important that building was, that it would be accompanied by a media event. And this is what it ended up looking like, um, and some of these pictures are here. Um, and the uh, building, these were tenant offices, and the editorial officers were under this gold leaf dome at the top. Pulitzer, as I described, was beset with all these problems. We've only been able to figure out that he actually entered the building three times in his lifetime. And there's some great panoramic shots over here. You should see this exhibit, by the way, Carol, is just stunning. I mean, you're, if you're getting bored with what I'm saying, please wander around. It's unbelievably good. But one of the things you can see from the panoramic shots that were taken um, um, up top is a sense of power. These reporters had dominion over New York. They could see into New Jersey. Nothing was blocked from there. And they felt what they were writing was the use of language in a powerful way. Not dissimilar, mind you, than what the um, broadcast media sometimes feels when they land with cameras and turn on the lights and dominate the scene. This is a print equivalent of that. The building was sumptuous on the inside. That's the Statue of Liberty. Uh, stained glass that is now up at, the, at Columbia in the World Room. Um, the elevators were the latest with the latest equipment to prevent you from falling to your death. Um, and it was considered a marvel of New York. Um, the paper, of course, used it as a symbol. Interestingly enough that I always went back and forth, um, it's the World Building, but it's also the Pulitzer Building. And as you can, I think you can see on the left above the big door, it says Pulitzer Building, and it says World. Um, and um, and it, it was regularly referred to in both ways. Newspapers at that time were, were identified with their owners. People would say, did you read in Pulitzer's World or did you read in Hearst Journal? We don't say that anymore, and that, except for maybe Murdoch. Most of us don't know the names of publishers. And it also had this sense of its power demonstrated by being above the clouds. And what's significant about this is that, um, um, here's a view of it. Um, I'm going to show you one thing and then I'll get back to it. This is a cartoon in 1908 over a Panama scandal. And this cartoon was circulated nationally, and yet all they used was the tip of the building. And that I want to show you because I want you to get a sense that this building wasn't just a New York building. It became a symbol that was understood, a cartoonish shorthand symbol. That's how important it became. So Pulitzer, and this is where I'll be trying to bring all these elements together. Pulitzer has changed the landscape of journalism in the United States. He alone hasn't done it. He is like, if you think of the Cubists in changing painting, there's a group of them, but who do we remember most? Picasso. Pulitzer is the Picasso of this group. There are other editors and publishers doing this. But they're building newspapers on a financially independent ground, advertising. Prior to their time, newspapers were political beasts. The two big papers in St. Louis when he was there was the Missouri Democrat, and the Missouri Republican. Now these papers, like the World War Democratic papers, in the sense they favored Democrats, but they were free to criticize them because the power that they had was economic. 
Um, and so they are now creating an agenda for the city. People are now looking to them not only for news about their lives, but for, for opinion, for things to do. And what I find so stunning is at that moment, this building is put up. So I want you to put yourself in the shoes of an immigrant coming to the United States in 1890. And this is a one-way trip. You're not going to be able to get a flight on Virgin Atlantic next holidays to go back and see Mama. You have risked everything to flee what you might have had back home to come to the United States. And you know, in some sense, we've turned into a nation of cynics. It's sometimes hard to understand how powerful that, that voyage was to come to the United States. And when you enter the harbor, the first thing you would see would be the Statue of Liberty that you can see in the distance there. Now those immigrants may not have known that the pedestal was built with the pennies and dimes of those who came before them. But that statue would have nonetheless been an impressive greeting. And now, those immigrants on a ship with a banister like this would be looking at New York and getting their first view of the new world, the world in which they're going to stake their claim and hopefully change their lives. And if the conditions were just right, the sun would be gleaming off that gold leaf dome. And so when they looked at New York and saw this beacon of light, what were they seeing? They were seeing the tallest building on the globe, and it was a monument not to banking, not to commerce, not to agriculture, not to retail, but a monument to the media. The only business in the United States that's explicitly named and constitutionally protected. And it's not just the media, it's the New York world that, as I told you, would become their gateway to independence, their introduction into American life, their instrument of socialization. So when he put up this building, Pulitzer didn't just put up a building on Park Row, he put up a symbol of the change, the seismic change that took place in American journalism and gave it a concrete version to match what he had done to journalism. I could go on for six more hours, but I said I only go for, on for 34, so I'm going to stop there and feel free to ask some questions if you have some. Yes, sir. Uh, St. Louis, I think, lays claim to the first skyscraper. Oh. Uh, and and St. Louis Post uh, dispatches also Pulitzer. Is there any connection? Not that I know. The building he eventually yeah. built in St. Louis wasn't that tall. Okay. And I'd have to, def, uh, you know, ask somebody who knows architectural history to know how good they claim it. St. Louis, of course, claimed everything. You know, it was really a wonderful <laughs> moment. Um, when Pulitzer is there, St. Louis plans on being the capital of the United States. It's in the centerpiece. The Hegelians, this group of uh, philosophers, believed that this, this was inevitable that this would happen. And they made all these plans for it. There were members of Congress who had introduced bills to move the capital to St. Louis. And then they've got a little problem. Chicago turned out to be the second biggest city in New York, I mean, the U.S. in the 1880 census, and that ended the idea. But um, it wouldn't be surprise me that this told them, but I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert in any sense. Yes? You, you mentioned earlier that the dome was a democratic structure. The uh, Capitol Dome, yeah. And what makes it democratic? Oh, in the sense that it's a building commissioned to house a representative government. Oh, I see. That's you know, if, uh, no, I don't mean that as a, well, there are some features to it. I mean, they, they don't put a monarch on the top. They put freedom on the top. But what I meant is that, it's, to me, it's a striking moment. Anything that was, would be or was, anything that was democratic or would be democratic in Hungary is going to occupy a building that would have uh, been an imperial design, you know, re reinforcing the, the notion of authorities from the top down. And the Capitol is a celebration of American democracy. It's a building commissioned to house a representative government. That's all I mean. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, we writers get nuts when we find these little things, and it just seems really cool that he was standing there looking up at it. He was probably thinking, it's hot, I can't wait to get out of these damn clothes and have a beer, but for me, it seemed like a really amazing moment. Yeah? Can you talk about what um, primary sources you found specifically on the world building in the commission? Any letters talking about what, what oh, yeah. you wanted? Well, Jenny Lee is here, who runs the, or one of the people, I should say, who runs the archives at Columbia, and I've lost count because it's been so many years, but there's about 106 boxes of world papers and 50-some papers of Pulitzer's. There's a lot in there of the correspondence between, well, not a lot, there's some between Post and, um, and Pulitzer about the building. 
And then there are all the, a lot of these artifacts that you have on display. Um, uh, in a sense, there's less than I would have anticipated. Um, but, you know, Pulitzer, Pulitzer's hands-on management meant that it fell to other people to carry out what he wants. So I think, you know, we tend to, um, to keep things that are associated with the great man. So when decisions were made near his death as to what to keep, there's probably a lot of stuff where those details would have been thrown out. Just like Kate Pulitzer's papers being a woman, you know, you wouldn't want to keep those. Those mm -hmm. same kinds of decisions were made, sadly. So. I guess the things that I'm wondering yep. about, it, and this is um, precisely in parallel, perhaps, with mm -hmm. Law Reed and the Tribune building, so we're talking about 1873, 4, mm -hmm. 5, um, Lee Gray found smoking guns of letters that went back and forth, and Whitlaw Reed oversaw every part of the project, uh, uh, including essentially the program it was, as it was written of the five or six or eight points about what the building was to be, a fireproof building, and this made of bread, this and that. You will see that with Pulitzer with his own houses. But you don't see that with the world building. Was there anybody else involved? Who was yes, the first Turner. Lieutenant Turner. Or? This guy named Turner, who's a God. This is what's so dangerous when you read a book six years ago. I guess the brother-in-law, who he puts in charge of all of the communication and the implementation of the plans. Where Pulitzer becomes, and it's just this is the kind of story you can live off for days. Um, you know, I told you about this Howard Hughes aspect, Pulitzer. His hands-on management of the construction of his mansion on Seventy Third Street his mansion in Maine and his house and you know, if I, there would been, if I was an architect, there's no amount of money Pulitzer could have paid me to work for him in those circumstances. Okay. Um, the building on 73rd Street, he wanted a bedroom, he, he's phobic about sound. So if you had lunch with Pulitzer and you crunched on your salary, you would get a memo the next day, next time you have lunch with Mr. Pulitzer, you no know, crunch, crunch on the salary, please. Um, he built a bedroom which had a wall and an inner wall and another wall and the floor was elevated on little pieces of metal to try to, and he brought in a sound expert from Harvard to spend the night and make sure it's silent. He gave him his word that it was silent. He had staff members stay there. Oh, Mr. Pulitzer is perfect. First night he's there, he's complaining. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever makes him happy. In Maine, the, the mansion he builds has its famous Tower of Silence, which is supposed to be so thick with stone that he could be silent. And you know, if you really get something that's silent, you actually start hearing noises, so he's self-defeating. But I never found that with Post. He, um, he enraged Post a lot um, in, uh, in, in insisting, you know, he would say, I don't want you to spend money, and then Post would say, well, will you, it would be the equivalent of redoing your kitchen and saying, don't want you to spend money, and they say, well, there's this nice piece of linoleum you can buy. I said, well, I don't want linoleum, that's cheap stuff. <laughs> so there was this real tug of war with that. But keep in mind, Pulitzer paid for the building in cash, no mortgage. Um, you know, so, but it's they, similar with the trivia, but, like, but I, I, get the re I, I guess the principal reason I'm asking is that without knowing anything about the, the building and the yeah. intention and, and the interaction between the architect and the client and all of that, um, I really, I'm sorry, but I really think this is a post force building. I, I, just, I, I <laughs> find it very ugly. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's magnificent in many ways, but it's it's so accreted with ornament, which I would call old world. And so I wonder if there's uh, if, if that was prescribed by. Hey, I Lewis don't think so. I, I don't. I, I think I think it's the the, the, the badness or bad taste issues I think come from Post. I don't I don't remember seeing anything where Pulitzer is insisting that he has some of these but weird little ornaments. Other buildings <laughs> don't have yeah. that, you know replete with um, it may be a puzzle with I sculptures and I mean I think you'd be disappointed if you go up to Jenny's shop. I don't think you're gonna find those kinds of discussions. But also keep in mind, you know, they would have them in person. I mean, you know, Post would have to hop on a ship, go to Paris, sit down with the man and then go home and want to jump off the bridge. Yes, did he get his bonus? No, he did not get his bonus. <laughs> he did not. Did he um, get the full payment? Or? Yeah. Yeah, he got paid, but he yeah. didn't. He didn't. Um, and the the the, the building of the um, I can't try to remember. It's October. The dedicate. It, it comes kind of pretty close, but uh, he didn't get his bonus. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. It had an obs observation uh, tower uh, section, or I don't know if you yeah. call it an observation tower. The editorial and there are plans here. The editorial offices are housed in this dome, which looks like a wedding cake that's just glued on the top. And, um, and so the evening world occupies one floor, 
and the higher you get up, the more you get into Pulitzer's inner sanctum, which of course he never went to, but that's where the editorial writers would have been. Because in his day, writing editorials was the most important part of that paper. I mean, he had a huge staff that would, you know, their job was to come up with 800 really good words, um, and so they were housed in this really elegant area. But there was public access to the Oh, yeah, yeah, you could get up. Uh, I mean, you might not be able to get to Pulitzer's office, but yes, no, there was, it's not like today. Was that observation section the topmost part of the dome? No, no, you couldn't go up and... Uh, not uh, outdoors, but within a room at the very top... Tonight. I'd have to look, you know, the they, the if you look over here, the you the can elevator. see the highest windows were there. I think those are only skylights. The no, they're, um, you know, it's Is there really, a walkway? I, I don't feel super confident of, the, of our conclusion on this, but we spent a long time looking at it in the sections, uh, and in that, in this publication, The, the World, It's, it's yeah. New Home, um, It's History, there is a, a lady with the bustle and she waves. That's right. I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah. Does, the yeah. dilemma is this is the classic historian versus biographer. Yeah. I have engraved on mm -hmm. my forehead the stories about Pulitzer. I could have spent six weeks studying what kind of stone was used for this building, but I would have gone bankrupt and, and the book would have never come out. So sometimes answering a question like that, Carol's going to be better equipped yeah. than I am. Just, was it free access? No, or nickel. That was my point. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, we ran the first camp for you a little later. Yeah. In 1995. And uh, I'm sure they despise one another. You know, instead of New York. That's a very polite right. way of putting it. Yeah, right. <laughs> that he owned the uh, corner circle and, and uh, I'm sure it's a uh, fan on the plaza in New York. But whatever, I mean, how much of a rivalry was there? Oh. I mean, did they ever uh, pay anybody to assassinate? <laughs> no, they did something even better than that. They tried to form a combination or a trust, which would have be betrayed everything they were editorializing against, to carve up the New York market when they realized they were killing each other off financially. But there was enormous personal animosity. Hearst, um, the first animosity is Pulitzer's an immigrant who paid cash for his building, and everything he has, he made. Hearst is coming to town with his mother's checkbook. <laughs> So, you know, you need another printing press, Mom, you know, no big deal. So when they get involved, and after the uh, Maine is blown up in 1898, and you have this famous circulation war, um, both papers engage in this sensationalism that later is called yellow journalism. That's the height of the animosity between the two. Hearst, had, by this point, had been raiding Pulitzer's newsroom regularly, because he could write a check. So, you know, if, you're, if somebody comes and says, I'll triple your salary, Brisbane, one of Pulitzer's editors, becomes the highest paid newspaper man in the country by going to work for Hearst. There's a lot to be gained. But the dynamic of the 1898 thing is very sorely misunderstood. You always see it in high history, high school textbooks. Pulitzer's World and Hearst's uh, journal engage in this rivalry which produces a sensationalistic news that's all made up and falsified and leads America to war. Well, we know that the latter is not true. Um, it didn't lead us to war. The war was certainly happening on its own. But the former isn't necessarily true, because Pulitzer in 1897 in December had lost his most cherished child, Lucille, who had died. Pulitzer wasn't in New York. He was hiding in Jekyll Island in depression. He wasn't paying any attention to what was going on in New York. So the dynamic you had is Hearst leading this competition with Pulitzer's soldiers back home with no general, thinking, if we don't beat Hearst, we're going to be out of job because he's not going to hire us anymore. So they're trying to outdo Hearst with every outlandish thing. And of course, the famous story is that Hearst publishes a, an article about the death of a colonel in the war. It's a very odd last name. The, the world not having the story steals it, republishes it, at which point Hearst announced, if you look at this odd last name, it's an anagram for we pilfer the news. <laughs> when Pulitzer gets back to town, he, um, he writes a memo, basically, and cites and others read it to the staff, and it's saying, you know, don't do this. So I think the real Pulitzer was not involved in that kind of sensationalism. He did believe in sensationalism, but for him, you had to have a corpse. You couldn't make up the corpse. Now, you could use some great adjectives. The bloody, uh, you know, the child sat in the pool of the father's blood, you know, and 
really pump up the story, but you had to have the very, you know, something behind it. Hearst wasn't really of that mind. They took it very personally, um, and then uh, after a while, they formed two alliances, one which was to crush the Newsies. So if you go to see the Newsies on Broadway, uh, let me give you the little footnote, they don't win yeah. um, and in the real world. Um, and the other alliance is they try to form a combination because they're realizing they're killing each other. But there is enormous animosity. Also, Hearst is, is, um, is quite anti-Semitic. In his writings, he, he has some really nasty remarks about Pulitzer being Jewish and, and attitude person. So no, no love was lost between those characters. Um, the other little tidbit, if you like to get into psychology, the paper that is almost going to knock the world out of business, William Randolph's Hearst Journal, had its origins. It was started by Albert Pulitzer, Pulitzer's brother. So every day when he was competing against a paper that might put him out of business, he was competing against his brother's creation. And they don't speak to each other the rest of their lives. Maybe one more question and then, um, yes, sir. I remember the World Telegram and Sun. Uh -huh. you know the, the sequence of yeah. Um, uh, Ralph is pretty much the one who takes over the world after Pulitzer's death in 1911. The, the world has one more glorious period in the 1920s when Walter Lippmann, Haywood Brune, all these great people write for him. And I like to think of it as sort of like a comet burning out. Um, they're not doing the kinds of things that Pulitzer used to do to keep the paper competitive. And in 1931, the family goes to court to break the will because the will stipulates that the paper can't be sold. And, uh, and, uh, and in the very, very end, the court rules that, that, um, that the family can sell the paper. And the editors and reporters make one last stab to try to buy the paper and keep the kind of Pulitzer idea going before it is sold to uh, Scripps Howard and it's going to become the New York World Telegram and then the New York World, I forget how many. But I'll read you this and this will end. This is 1931. The reporters and editors at the city desk that morning had taken part in a last-ditch effort to persuade the brothers to sell the paper to the staff. Instead, the three sons surrendered the world and the evening world to Scripps Howard for $5 million after obtaining a judge's consent to break their father's enjoyment that the paper never be sold. The resulting New York World Telegram carried only the name of the paper. Pulitzer's world was gone. The city editor, James Barrett, had just put the final edition carrying the announcement of the sale to bed. Everyone, he said, um, found, uh, one, uh, one of the reporters said, found a paper cup or two. This is 1931, you know you can't drink, right? Um, and the bottles weren't filled with water because what they were filled with took the wax off the cup and curved. <laughs> Suddenly, Barrett slapped the desk and burst into song. And to the tune of the battle hymn of Republic, the men belted out, J.P.'s body lies a moldering in the grave when the staff goes marching on. At three in the morning, they decided to move their wake to dailies, a speakeasy popular with newspaper men. They left the Pulitzer building and went into the chilly night and marched down Park Road singing. And that was the end of the world.